local addresses, right? If a router receives a packet with a destination in a link local, it won't forward it through other interfaces. Unless it has a bug, and it has happened before, but this is what it should happen. Local addresses are not routed. <coughs> Just like broadcast addresses in IPv4, remember that routers weren't supposed to route broadcast addresses. Um, unique, unique local, or ULAs, this is what we have that is similar to private addressing. Uh, many people ask me, uh, we don't have any more private space in IPv6, what do we do if we want to try something or we want to number our network that isn't connected to the internet? Well, we have the ULAs. Uh, what is different from the ULAs, it's not a, they are all part of the same prefix, but they are not like a short list like it used to be in the RSE, 1998, uh, 1918, um, ULAs can be generated. You need to use a seed, <coughs> usually a MAC address, then a hash algorithm is applied and you get a slash 48 prefix. And what is the idea of this? Is that it is reasonably unique. What do we mean by reasonably unique? Is you have a reasonable expectation that it will be unique. You could have a collision, but if you're lucky, you won't. Why this is important? Uh, there's a big problem with uh, merging networks. If you use private space, chances are that you're using the same, the same space, the same space in IPv4. Uh, even within the same company, and it happened to me in the past, uh, when you start working in different projects in different areas of the company, everyone uses them, right? and then we, you need to move that project into production, you end up you doing NAT inside your network. And this is for one project, then you have another NAT for another project, and another one, and another one. And very quickly, your network is just a mess, right? Mm -hmm. So ULAs are not a solution, but perhaps something that will help in the future, having reasonably unique space. Okay, multicast. What is a multicast packet? A packet that is transmitted to a single address but received by a group. Not every, not every router or every host, but a group of them, which is a toned down version of broadcast, right? Or more controlled way of doing broadcast. Any cast, one to the nearest, as you would say, instead of one to many, one to the nearest. Any cast is what we do today with DNS, for example. When we create uh, copies of replicas of DNS servers, we use the same address for them, everywhere. <coughs> the routing system is smart enough to route packets to the nearest, uh, to the nearest destination. And, um, okay, we are going to do any cast in IPv6 as well. So, okay. Uh, this is the funniest slide in the presentation. <laughs> address, address representation. We are going to use EXA. We are going to use this color notation. And was <coughs> how many bits an X digit represents? Four, right? We have 16 <coughs> hexadecimal digits. So each one of them represents four bytes. So how many bits do you have here in the address? Four, eight, six, 12, 16. Okay? Each column is the boundary of a 16-bit um, word, or whatever you call that. Yeah, it's a 16-bit boundary. Uh, you will have many, many zeros in the addresses. Most addresses have a lot of zeros. So we are going to do something about that. Basically, we will do what we do in normal notation. We will avoid the zeros that are the left, correct? So it gets a little bit shorter to write. But you need to remember that if you see something like this, there are three zeros here, okay? Now, if you have a bunch of zeros together, we are going to do something about that too. 
we are going to do this. We are not going to write them at all. And then we introduce the double column notation. Now it's, this is where some people get confused. And they say, okay, if I have many, many zeros, can I just put many double columns inside the address? No, you cannot. Because you wouldn't be able to actually map backwards the address if you have multiple double columns. So there is only one <coughs> double column per address. So this is shorter now, still a bit long, but shorter. And then we have some, uh, some nice examples, for example. What is this? Double column, double column one. All zeros, all zeros, and a single one at the end. This is the loopback address. Remember the 137.0.0.1 from IPv4 loopback? Well, this is loopback in IPv6. Uh, multicast space will be all under ff ff 0 a slash a sorry uh, ULAs will be all under fc 0 slash 7 global unicast is everything else and this basically we won't use them don't worry about that question yeah the f what does it stand for f sorry the c which one f. the f this f and the c yes this is uh, 15 it's an hexadecimal digit, which means uh, all, four, all four bits in one, which is equivalent to uh, decimal 15. Yep. They say don't worry about the IP4 map, but basically, isn't that what will then be used by, uh, if you still have the legacy IP4 addresses <laughs> to be handled by IP6? No, no, it's just a notational help. I mean, it's not, a, it, doesn't, it doesn't imply, this, this doesn't imply that you can actually route between IPv4 and IPv6. It's just helpful notation. For would example, that be, uh, would that be nice? It would be nice, but it doesn't work. It doesn't exist, actually. <laughs> if, you want to, if you want to connect an IPv6 only machine to an IPv4 only machine, you need something in the middle that will basically adapt to the protocols. Um, sometimes you will see, are you familiar with the netstat command in Unix? Yeah. All of you who see some mid Linux boxes will probably have used in the past. Sometimes you will see IP, IPv4 map addresses when you do a netstat. And it's basically because it's easier for you to realize what's going on sometimes. But it doesn't mean that the box is actually routing between IPv4 and IPv6 because it's, that is simply not possible. Okay. So, uh, some special use addresses, I already mentioned it. Uh, this one is, you will see this prefix a lot, the 2001. DB8 slash 32 is what is called the documentation prefix. Uh, many documents, books, and whatnot use that prefix. Uh, when I do hands on workshops, I tend to use that also to number the network. Uh, it shouldn't be present in the internet, it shouldn't be routed in the internet. Um, okay, link local addresses. Now, um, I'm going to, to jump a little bit forward. And the thing is, remember that in IPv4 we have some uh, satellite protocols, like ICMP, like ARP, like DHCP. Now, most of that functionality will be under the new ICMP version 6 protocol. Uh, ICMP will be transported over IPv6, so in order for that to work, we need some addresses, right? This is the most important role in local address, right? The link local is an address you have on your interfaces even if there is nothing else in the network. 
Right now, actually, if you open your notebooks, you already have a link local address configured for them, unless you have on purpose disabled the PDX. Um, the idea is that how can a computer generate an IPv6 address or an IP address, whatever, when it doesn't know what else is on the network? The thing is, it, it cannot have a complete, uh, can be fully sure that it's unique, but there are things that you can do that can um, that help a lot, like using, for example, MAC addresses as seeds for a kind of cryptographic algorithm, transform this MAC address. Since the MAC address is kind of unique, I say kind of on purpose because uh, if you know, I, Ethernet space is also having a kind of exhaustion problem. So it's kind of unique. So if you apply some math to it, you can create an interface ID that is reasonably unique within a single segment. So this is what you already have now. If you check your nodes, you have a link local address. Now, it doesn't mean that you have IPv6 connectivity. So many people sometimes get confused and say, oh, but I already have an IPv6 address. OK, but it's a link local address and won't get you very far. Um, interface ID thing <coughs> that is generated, automatically generated part of the address is what is called the interface ID. Uh, there are different ways of generating it. Uh, most, if not all of them, involve applying some cryptographic algorithm to the MAC address and perhaps other parameters. Uh, remember that the Ethernet address is 48 bits long, but the interface ID is 64. Okay? It's, so it's not enough. Using the MacAddis is not enough. You, know, you need to do something else. Uh, there could be another, perhaps, future methods of doing it. It's not. The only problem here is it has to be unique. It doesn't matter, actually, how it's generated. And then the, this lower 64 bits are going to be interface ID, and the higher 64 bits are going, what we call, are going to be what we call the network ID. Uh, I'm not going into this. Uh, okay, multicast. Uh, as I mentioned, multicast addresses are going to be very important in IPv6 uh, since there is no broadcast and there are some functions of the protocol that you need to implement that involve communicating many machines at once. We are going to use multicast. Uh, multicast in IPv6 um, has different scopes and different things. But the idea is that you can have basically this. You can mark an address and say whether it's a multicast for a, only a single interface, it's a multicast within a link, for example, with a, a single VLAN, um, is local within a site, which whatever, for some definition of site, or it could be global multicast, right? Uh, this field is basically an indication for a router. For routers, right? Uh, what should a router do with a multicast packet? Should it forward from one interface to another? If, a, if it's a link local multicast, no, it shouldn't. If it's a site local, it probably should, depending on the interfaces on the border. Okay. ELAs, as I mentioned, there are the equivalent of private space. If you want to actually configure an IPv6 network in your house, you can do that with ULAs. I actually do this in my home. I have my ULA prefix. I have everything with IPv6. And um, I'm of the philosophy that you should eat your own dog food, as they, they say in the US. Uh, so yeah, I have to feel the pain in order to be actually able to to, to, to face you guys and actually say that you can do this. It's basically transparent. You know it, everything works. The only thing that doesn't work in my place with IPv4, with IPv6, sorry, is an old laser printer that my wife uses. Uh, it's not a problem, actually. We, use, we also have IPv4, obviously. Um, I, I have a funny story to tell you about my wife and IPv6. <laughs> okay. Uh, the idea is that ULAs, as I mentioned, should be reasonably globally unique. Now, the only way
way actually to guarantee that something is globally unique is to have a registration system. That's what we do with the RIRs and the IAN and everything. There was a proposal at some point to have ULAs managed by the RIRs. But it doesn't make much sense, right? Uh, so this different idea of using ULAs is, OK, uh, basically reducing your expectation from unique, unique to reasonably unique, you can basically uh, eliminate the requirement for registry. Yeah, right. Because 
you will see that um, some auto configuration protocol will depend on this slash entity for boundary. Uh, this basically splits the address in half, right? 64 high bits, 64 low bits. Yeah. And the slash 48s and slash 32s. The slash 48s are, will be, I think, the most common assignments, uh, locations for users. And the slash 32 is supposed to be the most common assignment for ISPs. If you're an ISP, you get a slash 32 by default. Unless you prove you need something bigger, you then you get the slash 32. Um, if you're a company, you're not an ISP, you get the slash 48 by default, unless you prove you need something bigger. Um, then the big discussion begins. How big should the assignment that an ISP makes to a residential user? Some say it should be a slash 48. I think it's too, too big. Personally, I think it's too big. A slash 50, 56, I think it's a reasonable compromise. On the other hand, a slash 64 is too, just too small. OK. Uh, if you were expecting me to say how many trillion addresses or how many stars in the universe can you number with a BB6, uh, I, I hate that kind of comparisons. I won't, I won't make them. Uh, I think they are like um, old ladies' chat or something. Um, with all, all due respect for old ladies. Uh, I agree with you. <laughs> The thing is, some people would say that slash 64 is just a huge space. You could number how many thousands, millions of IP4 internets in a single slash 64. The idea is that you need to stop thinking like that. You don't think anymore about single host name You think about network segments. When in the past you used to think about how many hosts a network will have, you, you just forget about that. You think how many network segments. This is a different approach, right? In fact, most of you, I'm willing to bet, that have a very clear idea of how many hosts your network has. But you don't have that clear idea how many network segments your network has. Uh, why is that? Because every network segment will have enough space to whatever you throw away at it. Okay? You just need to relax and stop worrying about how many hosts. And the thing is, we all expect for the count of hosts to grow exponentially in the future, right? Single devices, we use many addresses, and we have a lot of devices. We, for example, we've been doing these lag day conferences for a long time now, right? Like 10 years. This is our 10th anniversary. And we have, been, we have this nice statistic about how many IP addresses we need for the conference network. Back in 2002, it was like uh, 0.6 or something like that. I mean, if you had 100 attendees, you needed 60 addresses, something like that. Last May, in Quito, in Ecuador, we reached the point when we needed 1.6 addresses per attendee, right? Because people tend to have like two, three, four devices, right? They have their laptop, they have their iPad, they have their a personal cell phone and a company cell phone. Okay? <laughs> Perhaps the right one or whatever. I think the thing is, you need more addresses than actually people in the conference now. A lot more, actually. Uh, it's not a problem when we do IPv6, but actually when we do IPv4, the conference is kind of an issue because actually not every ASP in every country we visit can actually give us like uh, just a, yeah, have this slash 32 and use it for a few days. We actually sometimes have to use our own addresses and do some things like that. Okay? So, questions? I scared you, I know. <laughs> the addressing part is actually very easy. If you think if you take a few minutes actually write some addresses and see some examples on the net, it's actually very easy. And again, as I mentioned, if you are into Scrabble or things like that, you should definitely play the game of creating words with IPv6 servers. And you will see a lot of dead beef on IPv6. OK. Uh, how 
I'm doing with the time? Sure. Okay. <laughs> For both of them? Um, yes. Or really? Okay. So I'm going to go straight to route four. Uh, <laughs> 